Director of Public Programs here at the National Museum of Women in the Arts. I am happy to have with us today Celeste Bailey. Celeste Bailey, she and I are going to be hosting this Brews and Views. Um, Celeste, how are you today? How are you feeling? Amazing. How's everybody out there? Thank you so much. So excited to join everyone this evening. I am excited as well. And I think we are just going to pop right into, we have AJ from Chocolate City's Best here that's going to be showing us. Well, she's actually a representative of Chocolate City's Best. You can find her at White, White Plates Black Faces on Instagram. And AJ is going to be showing us a cocktail, mocktail. Tell us more about it, AJ. Indeed. I'm um, not really sure what happened. There it is. I'm back. I think my uh, screen cut out a little bit there. Hello, everyone. My name is Andre A.J. Johnson. Um, I am currently uh, the managing partner and beverage director at Serenata. Um, today, I am representing Chocolate City's Best. Um, I have a few initiatives in the city um, that I work very closely with Chocolate City's Best. Um, they support my initiatives uh, like DMV Black Restaurant Week um, and Back to Black, and I, in turn, support their initiatives um, as well. Um, so I am super, super happy to be here um, and creating cocktails. Um, that is something that I hold very near and dear to my heart. So I hope that everyone had a chance to collect ingredients for this evening. Um, we were doing we're doing three different drinks. Um, one obviously is a mocktail, um, but if you had a chance to grab both, great. If you had a chance to grab for one that's great as well, okay? So let's get started just with what we need as a bartender. There's nothing better than a consistent cocktail all the way around, right? So we have to have our tools in order to make sure that that happens. So let's make sure we have a shaker tin. We'll need that for our cocktails this evening. I've got a little Boston shaker. If you have a two-piece tin like this one here, you can go ahead and use that as well. Make sure that you have some sort of measurements tool a jigger is what we like to call it behind the stick. Usually we like one with like one ounce on one side and two ounces on the other. But if you don't have that, that's OK. We can always make sure that we uh, get the appropriate amount of booze and product into our drink. OK, next, we obviously need ice because you cannot make a cocktail without ice. Otherwise, you might as well just drink it neat. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I love spirits and beers <laughs> and wines that you just do by itself. That's, that's the mark of a great um, alcoholic spirit. Um, and then outside of that, our actual products that we need, it would have been great if you were able to pick up some of these delicious Harlem Brewing beers. Um, I've got the 1946 lager right in front of me. That's the one that we're going to be using for our beer tail uh, this evening called the Big Apple. And I think we should definitely start there. All right. So let's go ahead and grab our Harlem Brewing 1946 lager. For that, we'll also need a sprig of rosemary. <laughs> rosemary. A lemon, oh yeah. <laughs> a uh, lemon, a whole lemon that we're gonna use for our garnish. If you have a cutting board or a knife, go ahead and you can cut a wheel off of there. Um, to start, we will need lemon juice. Uh, we will need Aperol, which I'll grab from my little back bar here, okay? And you had a little bit of homework. All right, which was to make an apple rosemary simple syrup. All right. Um, obviously, the reason why the name of the cocktail is called the Big Apple, um, it is Harlem Brewing. Um, however, the 1946 lager um, sort of calls back to the work um, and um, the efforts put in by Black farmers in the South. Um, and so I do definitely want to merge those two. I'm from the Bronx. My family um, was more so from Virginia and things like that. And so this was very, very fun being able to merge those two concepts into one cocktail. So let's go ahead and get started with our drink. All right. Let's go ahead and open up our tin. We're going to start off. Obviously, we don't want to shake beer. Beer already has carbonation and bubbles. So we're going to finish with our lager, but we are going to start off with half an ounce of our Aperol going right into our tin. Now, we don't want to build cocktails with ice in our tin because we'll over dilute. So just go ahead and pop it right into your tin. No ice, okay? Next, we'll need half an ounce of lemon. Fresh squeeze is always best if you got it. And finally, 
we're gonna do one full ounce of our apple rosemary simple, okay? Making simple syrups is a really nice, easy way to um, reuse either the outsides or even the fresh juice of any fruits or produce that you have in your house, herbs and things like that, that you kind of want to hold on to. Water, sugar, let it steep. You can create some magic, okay? So for this cocktail, we will need a taller glass, all right? A highball, anything like that. It's still the pandemic, so whatever glass you have works. As well. All right, let's go ahead and add ice to our tin. And we are going to lock in our tin and we are going to shake that on up, okay? Now when we're shaking, no shake weights, okay? What we wanna go for is more of a whip, all right? So we're gonna put our non-dominant hand on the bottom, dominant hand on top, flip it back and push out and whip, and I guess flick our non-dominant hands <laughs> and bring it back to you, okay? So 15 to 20 seconds hard shake. All right, now we're going to pop up our top, or if we have our two tin situation, you're going to grab a strainer and strain your cocktail right into your glass. Mm. All right, it's a really nice, beautiful red color. I mean, obviously, when I think of the Big Apple, my home, the Bronx, I think about that big, nice, beautiful sort of picture of that big red apple. So the Aperol is really what gives it uh, that color, but it also adds a little bit of bitterness back as well. And we're going to mm -hmm. add a little bit of fun here. This is where I think people don't realize how good beer and spirits go together. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, this particular lager um, is brewed with a little bit of orange peel. Um, orange is one of the components used in Aperol. So when you are using different you're sort of like cross utilizing your spirits and going back and forth um make sure that you're picking things that actually have like flavors in them and it also creates more of a flavor and a balance in your drink all right so we're going to go ahead and add about two ounces of our lager right in wow okay beautiful now your beer drinking friends can enjoy the rest so you can enjoy it later but we're going to go ahead and add <laughs> ice to our cocktail all right. Excellent. And now we're going to take our fresh sprig of rosemary. You're going to give it a little smack, smack, just to invigorate the esters and the aromas and pop that right in. And then we're going to take our lemon wheel, which I'm going to cut right now, and pop that right in. Okay. Boom. The big That's apple. Delicious. Awesome. That looks amazing. <laughs> if we want to do this non-alcoholic, we can do all of the ingredients, obviously outside of the, the Aperol. Can't add the Aperol. Um, I like to just oversteep my apple rosemary simple, right? And then instead of beer, you can add soda water, ginger beer, tonic water, sort of whatever mm. floats your boat. It's like a really beautiful agua fresca situation happening. All right. So cheers. 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 That's art. Mm. Wow. And it's super balanced. There's a nice rich, um, obviously, breadiness that comes through from the beer. Um, it is definitely um, a style of cocktail called a Rattler, which is essentially, you know, when you have cyclists or farmers and things like that in European countries, this, that style of beer came about because they still had to work <laughs> or mm. cycle or go about their day, um, but didn't want to get drunk. And mm -hmm. here we are. Sugar, beer, makes deliciousness, all right? Our second cocktail that we're gonna do this evening is a cocktail that I hold close to my heart. It is called Christmas Breeze. Uh, my father is from Jamaica um, and it was it is always super important uh, for me to sort of give that call back. Um, I feel like a lot of times in uh, when I see black brands and black business, the one thing I love learning about um, when these businesses um, hit my doorstep is what's the story behind that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so for the cocktail this evening, we're going to use Equiano rum. 
uh, the story behind Equiano. Um, yes, it is black owned, but it is also named after um, a young man who was um, indeed a part of the slave trade. Um, and the rum itself starts off in Africa and finishes off in the Caribbean. It's the only rum in the world to ever do that. And it follows the path of him through slavery. So we are gonna be using the Equiano dark rum this evening. Absolutely delicious. Absolutely delicious stuff. All right, we will need St. Elizabeth's Allspice Dram. All right, a little bit of Italian Amaro. There's nothing like a little bit of uh, rosemary and coffee and chocolatey undertones to sort of dry out that sweetness. I am allergic to bananas. However, <laughs> when it comes to creating cocktails, there's nothing that a Benadryl can't stop. So we need a little bit of creme de banane. And of course, you can't make a tropical cocktail without a little bit of pineapple. I'm telling you, that's my secret. Pineapple juice and anything, it's tropical cocktail. You've heard it first right here, all right? <laughs> so let's go ahead and clear out our tin. Let's go ahead and build the Christmas breeze, all right? So we need one and a half ounces of our Equiano Dark right into our tin. Again, remember, no ice in that tin. So what? Then we need half an ounce of our St. Elizabeth's Allspice Dram. It's gonna give you a little bit of nutmeg, definitely cinnamon, allspice, and clove. Now, if that's not Christmas, I don't know what is. We need half an ounce of our Averna Amaro. Again, a really nice, beautiful Italian uh, digestive. And we need half an ounce of our pineapple juice. Let's finish off with a quarter ounce of our creme de banane. If you can, try not to get the bowls and the things that are um, not real banana. Um, it adds just a, a different sort of mouthfeel to the cocktail and a sweetness that bananas don't generally carry. Bananas are, have a little bit more weight to them, okay? And let's add I to our tin. We are ready to shake. Now for this cocktail, you want a little bit of a shorter glass. We don't need a highball, right? We're not adding carbonation like we did for the first one. So a rocks glass works or any other glass that you would prefer. Let's go ahead and lock in. Non-dominant hand on the bottom, dominant hand on top. 15 to 20 seconds for our shake. <laughs> That's technique. Oh yeah. Oh, got to this one open here. Hold on. Uh oh. There she is. Excellent. We're gonna go ahead and strain off into our glass. Okay. Go ahead and add ice. And if you would prefer because I love a good garnish. We're gonna make it snowfall a little bit with some nutmeg, okay? So I'm gonna have to do this off camera just for a second, but I'll show you what I'm doing here. I just grabbed a microplane. If you have whole nutmeg at home, you can go ahead and just sprinkle the nutmeg right on top and grate a fair amount. It adds to the texture and creates just a really nice, beautiful look. So I'm gonna see if I can pull my camera down here a little bit, just so you can see. It's just a nice what little- What does it smell like? Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and that is your Christmas breeze. All wow, right. that is a great, a lot of layers of flavor there. It's, it's a beautiful cocktail. I, I, I really hope that um, some of y'all were able to make this at home because it's, it's just, it's super fun. It's light. I know rum isn't everybody's favorite thing, but it balances out really, really nicely. So cheers to you all. And thank you so much for having me. Cheers to you, AJ. Thank you so much. This was amazing. Thank make you. Make sure you make your recipes. Oh, indeed. Indeed. Yes. So I want to give a big, please, Melanie. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Big shout out to AJ. The cocktails were absolutely delicious. Uh, the Big Apple was really, is so special. 
I really appreciate all the creativity and flavors that went into those cocktails. Please make sure we get the recipes. And, and thank you so much for sharing this experience with us this evening. I look forward to tasting and having one in person with you when I get to uh, DC, right? My God, please do. Please do. Okay. I, uh, I've tasted these. They're fantastic. If I can find, I mean, whoever distributes them, I'll find them. They're going on my list. We'll get them to you soon. Cheers to you, AJ. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate your tuning in. Now we're going to move into our conversation with our amazing guest. Uh, a lot of what we just saw, it's all art. Life, art is everywhere, right? And life is all about art. And with the Museum of Women in the Arts, I'm so honored to be here again for our brews and views. And we have a really exciting show coming up this evening with our guests. We are going to be talking about, you know, art and creating art for inspiration, the business of art uh, with the restaurant, Sylvia's restaurant, the curatorial background and experience that Michelle will be bringing to us. So I want to get into who our guests are. Uh, we'll be interviewing and talking to and having a conversation. We want to kind of relax, chill out, have some fun, discover one another and really look at just how broad the platform of art is and how it touches on all of our lives. So I'm very excited to have Kendra Woods. I want to make sure I have the right generation. I'm pretty sure she said fourth generation restaurateur. Third family. generation. Did I get that right? <laughs> I'm fourth third generation. generation. They've been around a long time. <laughs> More than We've been years. around a while. Yeah, did I get that right? Okay, we have Kendra Woods with Sylvia's Restaurant, the granddaughter of the Queen of Soul. And this is very personal to me because I was in Harlem for many years. And before I get off on my emotional uh, uh, state here, I just want to say to them that, you know, more than a restaurant, more than just a business, this is an incredible family that has a long history. And I, we're gonna get into, you know, how did they maintain this business? What type of art was incorporated in the relationships with the community and within their family to keep this going? So we're going to be talking to Kendra about that legacy, about her background working in this amazing family, and how they supported entrepreneurs like me. My first order in terms of me getting started as a brewer was with this family. Not only do they make incredible food, they're just incredible people that really are truly about community, equity, and supporting entrepreneurs. So we're going to de delve into that. There will not be enough time to get into all of that. So please stay in touch when you're in New York. Visit Sylvia's Restaurant. She's going to be talking about that. So we're going to get into that in a moment. Then our other guest is Michelle Gomez, who I recently learned about. Another aspect of how art is all about life and everywhere is her background and experience as a curator, her background and experience about taking split places and, and experiences and adding art to that from a curatorial standpoint. She's gonna talk about something I just learned about, emotional intelligence. What is that, Michelle? We're gonna get into all of that. So we're gonna start first with, with Kendra. I have so many questions for both of you. And as we're talking about the subject from the standpoint of the Museum for Women in the Arts. You know, women in the arts, we touch everything. Everything to us, we're able to take that and create art. We live it, we make it, and we inspire so many people. So Kendra, I just wanted to kind of get into this whole kind of idea of how art, how you use art in terms of just, you know, you hear a lot about family businesses and how they grapple with working together, but I've witnessed from my own experience in your restaurant, how you've been able to do that for so many years, how you've maneuvered generation to generation with your grandmother starting here in the South where I am, migrating up yeah. to New York, building this platform. How do you do it as a family? What do you incorporate from an art standpoint from a strategy standpoint, whatever you want to share about how you came to be now fourth generational involved with this business operating it. Talk to us a little bit about what goes into that. Sure. So um, I am personally, I'm third generation. I'm Sylvia's grandchild. Um, and then the generation behind me, that's four. They coming up and they're working hard. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Celeste. This is really awesome. So our art is food. 
our art is food and we love food and we love people. It's something that my grandmother was very passionate about. And we've all just come up behind just being very passionate about food and helping people and just having um, a sense of community with the people mm -hmm. that are around us, whether mm -hmm. we're related or not. Okay. You, you've just come through a big pandemic. We've all been pivoting and all those fancy words they throw around about how do we make it through okay. that. And I was there in July and I saw how you had the beautiful cafe set up, all the things that you were doing to, to maintain business, to thrive through that period. What's happening now at this point um, in terms of some of the exciting projects you're working on to keep the business growing and thriving for the generations to come and for the community? Right. So it has been a very long, about 20 months uh, since COVID started. Uh, what we're doing now, we've been actually closed for the past eight weeks, um, mm. doing some renovations in our kitchen. Um, we're excited to get back and be open. We plan on being open Thanksgiving Day, which is also our busiest day of the year. But our community relies on us heavily when it comes to their Thanksgiving turkey and their uh, cornbread dressing. Oh, yeah. So right now, our kitchen, we're doing a new bar. So we can't wait to have Sugar Hill back a, up and running on the bar because we miss it so much. Yes, <laughs> a bar. <laughs> what used to be our traditional counter will now be a counter slash bar for anyone to be able to sit at any time of day. Wow. And how are you maneuvering in the pandemic in terms of you know, people that are vaccinated, people that are not vaccinated in New York, are you able to sit together? Are you able to, well, how does that whole, you know, thing work with, with the current state of, of hospitality in New York City? So right now, um, you do have to be vaccinated to sit and dine inside, but we do have a fabulous outdoor structure for anyone who isn't vaccinated. If there's a party and half people are vaccinated, half aren't. They could still sit outside. It has a bunch of heaters in it. It's beautifully decorated. And you still get the same great service inside and out, whether wow. you're vaccinated or not. <laughs> wow, that, that's amazing. Now, one of the things that got me excited about this conversation between you, given the hospitality and restaurant background that you've had for so many years and how the family has continued to build and thrive, mm -hmm. is how that connects to what Michelle does, which I've seen and experienced in your space because, you know, food is art. That's right. You created a whole ambiance there with pictures and mm -hmm. art and all the further extend what's important to you and how people experience the food. Now, Michelle, based on what I learned about her background, she has done some amazing things, and which is why I'm sure you guys will be connecting after this whole conversation around how art is integrated into weddings and, and different life experiences. As the founder of Creative Union Design, she has a really interesting take on how those two spaces, how people experience life, their experiences, their ceremonies through adding art as a facet to that. So Michelle, tell us a little bit about, you know, this whole thing that you're, you're doing I don't know if there's a name for it. I did read something about emotional intelligence. I'm just kind of, that's just such a cool term. So I want you to talk about that at some point where it fits. But talk to us a little bit about how you as a curator and your background looks at occasions and ceremonies and how art can extend people's experiences. Amazing question, Celeste. And thanks for bringing me on board, Milani. And, th and it's so inspiring to hear about your story, Kendra. Um, and just how entrepreneur that entrepreneurial spirit really runs in your family and in your blood. Um, so I, um, I've been a creator my entire life. I do everything from making art to curating art exhibitions um, in weddings mm -hmm. and life celebrations um, to even coaching artists and other creators like me to build businesses to get paid to do what they love. And the number one thing that I find in common through all these things that I do is this golden thread of just, you know, just 
curating art, right? Like it's all about bringing people together through art. And when I'm coaching, I'm also curating other people's stuff and ideas to help them form their own unique creative businesses. So um, through Creative Unions Event Design, which was founded in 2017, I produced two major weddings in art exhibitions. It's the first event planning company of its kind. And then a lot of artists looked to me and they said, how the hell did you get paid to do all that? Because you know the stereotype is that after art school, you're like a starving artist and you, you don't really know how to start a business. So then a bunch of them started to hire me as, as a life and business coach. And this is where emotional intelligence came in. You see, I found that businesses could not start and could not thrive if there were life problems in disguise, meaning stagnant energy, stuck emotions, unresolved traumas, right? Keeping the creator or the artist stagnant in their business. So as their coach, I would help them navigate those emotions, navigate those traumas through enhanced emotional intelligence. Um, emotional intelligence is, is defined as the ability to perceive use, understand, manage, and handle your emotions so you can get stuff done, so you can create without limitations, so you can create without those petty trauma responses that get get in the way. So mm -hmm. I do a lot of things, and actually, I paused my event planning business, and guess what? It's coming back coming back y'all for Art Basel this year after the after the pandemic you know we're on pause for Art Basel and now we're back at it again in Miami and I'm curating an art exhibition uh, for Art Basel and revealing my artwork as well so lots and lots of things going on I see everything that we do as a creation just like these cocktails that you know AJ just created just like the food that um, Kendra's family creates just like the beers that you create Celeste right everything is a creation. Wow, wow, wow. So is there any advice you can share? Because this is just so much information. I'm rethinking how I'm going to do everything around here art-wise. <laughs> um, is there anything that you could advise or a bit of advice? Or I'm not sure how I'm saying it, but I just picture you walking through spaces and places and giving people insights about how they can incorporate art into their experiences to make their lives, whatever it is they're doing, whether they're a business owner in a, in a um, office or a restaurateur trying to extend the experience beyond the food or a brewer trying to extend the experience beyond, you know, just what goes in the glass, but give it people more ways. Is that kind of the way you approach it as a curator? Yes, definitely. So as a curator, my advice to everyone is to pay attention to the emotions that come about from the environmental space and environmental energy. Is the energy stagnant? Is the energy flowing? Is the energy inspiring? Is the energy depressing? Right? Oftentimes, and Milani can speak to this as well, you know, when we study curatorial practice in school, we're told to put art in a white box. And me and Milani really got out of that formula and we see art everywhere. We see exhibition opportunities everywhere. You know, think about someone eating and drinking your beer, right, in a white box. How would that feel versus in a home versus, you know, in a laundromat versus in you know a hotel lobby right how can we how can we enliven the experience how can we see it in a new way how can we see it in a more creative way so Kendra you know I would actually encourage you to to think beyond the box of the restaurant formula right like in the art world we have the white cube gallery formula and in the restaurant world we have you know the formula of sitting around a square table what would it look like if we ate your food um, standing up looking at art? If we ate your food on the floor? If we ate your food like outside, right? If we ate your food um, while projecting film, you know, what would that do to our digestive systems, to our bodies, to the way we communicate, yeah. the way we, we talk to each other? So that's, that's my advice <laughs> in a nutshell. It will be beautiful. <laughs> So 
So, Kendra, I have to add, please, Milani, jump in. Because uh, I've had a beer or two, so things get a little flowy. Um, oh, you're awesome. You're awesome. Um, I'm loving it. I'm Kendra, loving it. Kendra, we were talking a couple of days ago. I wanted to get some updates on all the exciting stuff you're doing. And you're adding these experiences. Yeah. You're adding these facts. All right, that long bar that your grandmother yeah. created that to my recollection from the story that was it was one bar one counter right and then it blossomed it was just the counter grew wow so creating this art mm -hmm. and experience all around that is that kind of how you think of it and then when i think about how your plate comes to the table and be with the fried uh with the with the fish because i eat a lot of fish fish yeah. green it's yeah. also beautiful it's art on the plate yeah. That's uh, you. Absolutely, absolutely. We love when people order different size because the colors and the way they come together when they come out and it hits that table and the guests are just like, oh, like this is beautiful. <laughs> those colors, those candy yams next to like mac and cheese and a piece of fried chicken. It is a beautiful thing to see. Beautiful. And, and it's something so old fashioned. Yes, <laughs> and tasty very old-fashioned and traditional and from home and it feels like home when it's in front of you before you even touch it just smelling it just looking at it it feels like home it feels like something that from a memory you know wow so it's curatorial it's all curatorial i guess yeah. i don't know you tell me yeah. i just <laughs> I think you're so. right, Celeste. You <laughs> ask yourself, right. trust yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so our world likes to make us feel like we don't know. <laughs> and I think that's the beauty of curating is just that once we realize that in some ways we all do it, you know, that we everything in some some part of our life has to be curated, um, which the original word means really to care for. And um, to take it down to the point of like, what are the main items that I need to convey a point? So, you know, when you're making mm -hmm. that plate, you know, there's certain things like we're, we're not putting the juice on the plate. Like we, there's certain things you have to narrow it down to make it Absolutely. right. We know some plates, some dishes just don't belong together. Um, right. It's the same way, you know, when we put art together, yeah. we're like, no, this doesn't, these, some things are more in conversation with each other. Like I know those candy yams are in heavy conversation with that macaroni and cheese. <laughs> Ask me you how I know. know. <laughs> <laughs> They're in conversation. Okay, keep it going, Melanie. And also, um, <laughs> Celeste, I just love how um, with these with these two, and 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 you have brought Kendra and me bringing Michelle to the table. I think that just hearing how all three of you all creating your own spaces brings other women. Like it's like makes so much more room. And I'd love to hear some of you talk of that too. Just how being yourself makes more room for other women to be at the table too. I could Absolutely, that. well. Okay. Go ahead, Kendra. Yeah, um, I'm definitely very passionate about um, women in business, especially because my grandmother started this business. Um, she bought her real estate where the restaurant is located and being able to encourage and bring on other, especially women in business to do the same and open mm -hmm. in those opportunities and giving someone else a space, a space that we have and it's available to the people who wanna work hard for it. Um, we use, we outsource to local bakeries. Um, of course, Celeste, one of the greats with that wonderful Sugar Hill beer that we miss so much. Our people love it so, so, so much. It's Harlem's beer. Mm. So definitely being able to assist other people and giving people a platform if you have it. Wow. Michelle? Uh, um, so most of my coaching business um, is focused on women. Most of my clients are women identifying folks. And in working with women, what I've realized is that when we break the norms and the boxes of who we think we should be, um, that we don't need to just be caretakers, we don't need to just be mothers, we don't need to be just nurturers, we end up becoming our true authentic self when we heal those traumas, right? And I want to pull up a quote by Maya Angelou, who says, success is liking yourself, liking what you do, and liking how you do it. And I think when you really find your, your true authentic self beyond the boxes that are 
put on us as women, we end up doing exactly what Maya said, which is liking ourselves, liking the way we do it and liking um, what we do. And when we do that, we serve as an example to other women to do the same. So me being in my power, liking what I do and liking how I do it has helped hundreds of women and people who identify as women to do the same. And when we have children or when we mentor the next generation, they too will do the same thing. Yes. Well, I have definitely had an amazing journey connecting with women in the beer industry and getting an email or call saying, you know, it's so good, it's great to see you as a woman doing this. It's inspiring, it's encouraging, it's made them feel comfortable with the whole idea of venturing into this industry. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm just still trying to make this thing happen. As you know, Kendra, you know, challenges abound, but possibilities are so much yeah. greater. So it's just been really a beautiful thing to almost on a daily basis. If I'm out, when I'm here in North Carolina in Harlem, I'm asking people constantly, you want to learn the brew? They're like, coffee? No, beer. Just letting them know that it's possible, that, you know, this is something they can do. And when they see us as women in these different roles doing things, they're so encouraged. And I'm happy to share insights, information, any resources I have to give to them so that they can explore the possibilities in my industry or anything that I might have a connection to directly and indirectly. So it's been a really beautiful journey to see how, you know, the things that we're just just generally passionate about, people see it and it means so much. I hear the word pride a lot, you know, so proud, we're so inspired. You just, they have to see us and they really appreciate being able to see us do the things that they do because it gives them, you know, that encouragement they need to step out of their comfort zone or step out mm -hmm. of whatever, keeping them from continuing to pursue, you know, their dreams. So I think it's, it's just really great. I so love good. it. So Les, yeah. as you keep it going, I'm just gonna look in the chat to see if there are any questions. And so any questions? I will I'll, um, check the chat, but you can keep it going. Yeah, I'll keep it going guys. So here we are. And I think the beauty of what I'm enjoying about the brews and views, it's just starting, is how important it is for us to connect. You know, uh, we think about places like Sylvia's, you know, one of the big challenges we have in our communities across the country, mm -hmm. black and brown, is that we don't have the gathering places. No offense to the fast food joints, but having a place that's full of beauty, whether it's the food, whether it's the ambiance, whether it's you know the pictures on the wall that I'm so inspired for. When you go into Sylvie's, you see all these personalities that you know and people that you don't know captured in the photograph, and you you're just inspired by that. You know, you you have a place you can sit at a counter, at a bar, at a table, and almost all the time, whether it was me or my friends, we're connecting with someone next to us. We're able to connect in a way where we can have meaningful conversations that lead to collaboration. And this discussion we're having right now on this platform to see both Michelle and Kendra talking in the way that they're talking about art and how it impacts the different businesses and experiences and journeys. I'm just looking to see what happens when you guys connect after this call after this discussion today. So I, I just think it's a beautiful thing. And um, I'd love for you guys to talk a little bit more about some of the ways you think, you know, trade ideas, share experiences between the, the, the two platforms that you share. I'm not sure how you might jump into that, but I'm just thinking my mind is all over the place in terms of what I know about Sylvia's and the amazing stuff that you're doing and what I've learned about Michelle and how complimentary those things are. Yeah, I have a question for Kendra. Sure. So is there a special anniversary coming up for your business? There is. We are on our road to 60. August 1st, uh, we'll be celebrating 60 years in business. We opened uh, August 1st, 1962, way before I was born. <laughs> wow. wow, 60 years. So tell me yeah. what? are you planning on creating for your anniversary? Not just celebrating, because remember when we just celebrate, we're, we're 
you know, we're not being, we're not being in control of the environment, right? What are you right. creating in order to celebrate six years? Well, one thing that we do always do to celebrate is um, every August 1st for about two to three hours, we do a free breakfast for the community. So anyone walking up and down the street, they're passing in their cars. It's like, come and get a plate, come and get a plate. And we've been doing that for since before I was born. Um, every five years, we do a bigger celebration um, that incorporates more of our local businesses, our local bakeries, Cake Man Ravens, amazing, delicious cakes, Make My Cake, that's located on 139th. And then for our upcoming year, my sister, Trinez Woods Black, um, she probably will be curating a block party that she started um, to make it very special and um, intimate and just available for the people who have been supporting us from the beginning. Um, we've been open so long, we do a lot of repeat business. We have people who eat every dinner with us every single day. Like I know they've been hurting since we've been closed, but that's the beauty in it. They've been waiting, they're coming, they're calling, they're knocking on the door like today, today, they are so ready for us to be open and we miss them so much. It's a warmth in the building that is missing right now without our community. And we just can't wait to get back there. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. That's awesome. And tell me, um, you know, I mean, it seems like you're already creating those things, right? Like I was like thinking, you know, what kind of art do you want to have be a part of this? But it looks like y'all are already creating the site activations, right? The installation, right? The performance yeah. art, <laughs> like all that stuff. It's just, it's such a natural part of your abilities. So I really applaud y'all for, for being so um, cognizant and, and being such a, such a, an emotional anchor for the community. That's amazing. Yeah, and that's what we are. We actually have been discussing in what is our outdoor structure now, um, possibly having some local artists uh, feature something for like six months on our glass wall that we have. And it's really nice. It's so beautiful and well lit. And I just think it would be beautiful if we could showcase somebody for a period of time because, uh, you know, you go out now, everything is about taking pictures and what's new and exciting. And I think something that is special that someone can tag on Instagram or any type of social media to just say, look, I was here and this artist has this piece here. I think that would just be so great. That might be something we need to uh, talk about afterwards and see if you can help us make that happen. <laughs> Hell yeah, I'll fly all the way from Miami to help you make that happen. And it gives me an yes. excuse to stay there for at least a month to collect oral histories, yeah. to do research, yeah. to look at the archives, right? Um, yeah, no, that would be so fun, Kendra. Thanks for, for bringing that up. Yeah. yeah, I think that would be beautiful and amazing. Uh, one of the things that's happening here in the town of Rocky Mount is that there's a real uh, excitement about creating an art district and you have all these amazing artists and it's like how do you choose which artists I know Ronald Draper in Harlem has been a great uh, artist you see a lot of his work around Harlem and he's he's amazing and we're talking about doing some stuff together is this this space that you're talking about is it digital or is it something that um it, it's it become kind of like a and you guys would know better than I something that's kind of rolled on and then change and preserved? What type of surface, um, you know, what, what is it exactly? Is it something that you can change from time to time or is it gonna be kind of a permanent installation for six months and then taken away and used somewhere else? What are you thinking about that? Uh, I was thinking about something for six months that could be taken down and then giving another artist an opportunity to showcase their piece for another six months. Oh. That's kind of where I was going with it, myself and my brother. He's very, he's into art. He loves it. And we have so many pieces around the restaurant from pictures to yeah. work from different local artists just over the years that my grandmother has kind of just put together throughout all this time. And everything is up in the building throughout um, one of our five dining rooms in our catering hall. And it's just beautiful. And I think that our generation should definitely start to come up and showcase new artists, new looks, new ideas, 
fresh takes on things and just be prepared going into the next 60 years of business. Wow. That's awesome. Next 60 years. I like that. Like creating yeah. um, a space to ensure that the next 60 years is, is coming, right? Um, you know, yes. what if you created like a digital um, brochure experience to, you know, open up revenue streams to people like to that, that say, you know what, I appreciate their history so much. I appreciate their art. I appreciate their archives so much. I need to go and fly my ass over there to, to not only eat there, but to experience this exhibition and learn and, and take so much more away than just, than just a meal, right? Like that is definitely right. opening up the doors for the next 60 wow. years. So think about like I an like online that. exhibition. Yeah. I like that. It gives us such a purpose. Yeah, yeah. Because like, yeah. you know, with NFTs rolling around, like Melania, I don't know if you're doing any sort of program or programs at the museum around NFTs. I'm still learning about these things. I but um, <laughs> artists are go. Oh, you are. Okay, you can tell us a little bit about that. But you know, I it's going so in that direction. Continue, please. Oh, oh, she said she's still learning as well. Maybe we should do it. We have to. We're thinking about doing some sort of program because it's something to definitely be learned. Um, and then also, Kendra, we have an exhibition up now called Reclamation, and it's Remedies, Recipes, mm -hmm. Rituals. It's an online food portal where people got to contribute um, food memories and food history. I'll send you the link to it so you can look at it um, because, yes, you know, there's some, amazing. Yeah, there's some. Send it to um, me too. Oh, yeah. Send us a, a group email so we can continue this. this so everybody can see. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, all of this is definitely. Um, definitely making me hungry <laughs> and it's so funny but michelle when you were talking about with the nfts i've also been looking at like you know virtual reality spaces and just how all these other alternative spaces are being created and um what that looks like for women in those spaces for like how you know how are people represented it's just a lot of a uh, lot of questions so i'm with celeste on this one i'm definitely learning about it. i've got a lot of questions so we might just have to find the experts on that one and ask them Right. Yeah, That's I'm the times that we're living in. Yeah. yeah I, let's about what I learned about the legacy and history of the Woods family. I'm in this sort of migration, remigration mode because a lot of that is happening prior to during the pandemic. You you have people rediscovering their lives in the South, going back, you know, trying to help revitalize, you know, bring pull pull people up and help them out um, in the community. But I'm just thinking about, you know, that whole journey. And I'm thinking about, what's the name of the artist that does the migration series? Jacob, Jacob Lawrence. Jacob Lawrence, yep. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the whole experience around your grandmother, uh, Sylvia Woods, and that trip from the South. Mm -hmm. And it kind of looks like a whole sort of series of paintings and something in a digital format where people, it's like a museum, you know? And you're mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. also space or something that takes, this is such an amazing legacy. I mean, the fact, you know, it's just so rare to have, and unfortunately in Harlem to see families hold on to ownership of their properties, ownership of their businesses. And people are searching for those stories so that they can believe that it's possible to do what your family is doing. And I just kind of see this sort of, I don't know, kind of like a museum, people walking through seeing Mrs. Woods, Coming from the South, there's an image of that, or establishing that initial counter that I read mm -hmm. about. And that sort of, what happened over 60 years, each decade, what were the milestones? That's kind of what, and maybe it goes back to that, what did you call that thing, the bulletin or the, the, the um, like a digital brochure experience. Mm -hmm. so I think it's yeah. like a nicer way of saying online exhibition. It's such a powerful <laughs> story. It's such a powerful story that people, from our communities and other communities need to see 60 years is a long time to be able to continue to own, operate, mm -hmm. and work with thrive as a business. It's such an important thing for people to know. I love that. Yeah, Celeste. we've been oh very God. blessed. It also like the easiest way to secure the next 60 is to document, archive, celebrate, and uplift the 60 that has already been, you know? And also what I love so much about that um, is that sometimes people will look, like I'm thinking about the person who first comes to New York 
and they see Sylvia's. This is not something they know. They don't know the history of it. They don't know, you know, the history of the neighborhood and how these things have changed. And they might get this wild assumption that this is something that happened in maybe like the five past five or 10 years, right? And it's like, right. no, we're not new to this. We're true to this. It's been a long time. So right. having that documentation <laughs> is a beautiful, um, beautiful. I, I love all the ideas that are coming together. Yeah. Oh, you can yes, even do definitely. Like we're not new to this. Yeah. Oh. You can do an incubator for the next uh, 60 years of restaurantpreneurs, mm. specifically Black restaurantpreneurs. Um, you see, it's it's not just about art, it's about programming as well. And Milani, you know, knows this, you know, as like the programs manager at the museum. Um, mm -hmm. You know, let, let's let's talk, Kendra. Let's all. Yeah. 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 Six, we oh, need 60 to. years is a long time. Look, 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 look. I'm seeing a whole sort of, I don't know what it is, but I think about what I've been seeing Trinette's doing. Miss Hospitality, is it? Miss, I forget what she's. The whole branding around that, which is incredible, which is mm -hmm. her live it. Yeah, I'm, queen of hospitality. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. thinking about the whole piece that we've been talking about, art, you know, the art, the curatorial piece, the plate, the experience of art in the place, and, you know, what Michelle is talking about, the connection between that. I, this is, I don't know, I'm sort of going out and deep in on this, but, you know, what if, I see these <laughs> affiliatory relationships between museums and places related to art. Do museums, yours sort of have this sort of affiliatory, whatever you call it, with an institution, because this is an institution, Sylvia's is an institution, right? Maybe yeah. there's something around this curatorial piece that ties back into what you just mentioned about that, that space that you're creating about food void pathways. I'm just, I'm just thinking. I mean, I think it's all, it's, it's all excellent. And I think like, um, you know, museums, like any other place, if they want to be relevant, they're in community, they're in partnership. And if you're not in relationship, then you're probably not relevant. So there's always ways to um, explore those options. You know, um, I cannot believe that this car, like that we're almost down to the last what? bit of it. I know. I but know, my goodness. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I got to go and go. like, and just really like two minutes, we wanted to, you know, kind of wrap it up. So Celeste, I'm gonna, I would love to just hear from you since you have uh, brought together with Brews and Views, uh, we have, you know, come with this concept and you are really wanting to have this way that people come together. So I would love to hear you close us out and, um, and just take us home. Wow, wow. I, you know, the beautiful thing about this conversation is that we started and we weren't sure where we were gonna go. Mm -hmm. And we discovered these amazing guests that we have, Kendra Woods, Michelle Gomez, both very passionate people about what they do, this amazing family legacy, this platform that Michelle has created to really discover art everywhere. And then the coming together of this conversation where we discovered and heard Kendra talk about the art on the plate, you know, the art in the space, the art of how to manage all these relationships in the family that we know becomes kind of a challenge to keep mm -hmm. this legacy intact. We hear about things falling apart everywhere, but there is an art. And it goes back to Michelle's emotional intelligence. Now I understand what that means about yeah, we're going to be emotional. We're going to have to make a lot of tough decisions as you're making right now, waiting for the restaurant to reopen. You're going to have to be able to make those tough decisions, looking at my time. And then, you know, say to yourself, you know, let's set the emotions aside and look at the bigger picture. Let's think about what our mother and grandmother really was doing with this legacy. Let's kind of put those things in check so we can focus on the possibility of of making sure that this legacy survives and thrives. And that emotional intelligence piece, I think, comes in. But what I learned, I learned a lot, is that, you know, when we look at art, you know, it's life. We live it every day. We express it in so many different ways. And I'm most excited about the Museum of Women in the Arts giving me the opportunity to share with them in producing this platform, Brews and Views, 
we did have some beers. We had some great cocktails from Chocolate City and AJ. But I think what we have here and what's most important during these times that we're in, in a world that's full of chaos and madness, is how do we find the common interests, the common grounds to move forward together? And I'm, I'm very excited about what I heard between the two of you, and I hope that you will stay in touch because I, I can see there's a lot of facets to art that you're both very passionate about, your different spaces. That will just be amazing you know, as we continue to have this conversation going forward. So thank both of you. And if you have anything to add, I think we have a couple of minutes. I'd certainly love to hear from you, but I think this is, this is what we have to be about. How do we find ways, platforms, places to share the things that we're passionate about and discover you know, that common ground that we talk about a lot? Yes, I, I would love to just add one more thing that I've been thinking a lot about the word art versus creation. And in my heart and in my soul, I, I believe that the word creation and being a creator is what really will bring us together when everyone recognizes that they are a creator, creating creations. Because art can sometimes like push people away and, and make them feel like I don't understand it. I'm not a visual artist. I don't paint on canvas. And then I just look at that person and I say, hey, have you created lately? And they'll be like, yeah, yeah. So I think what we all have in common here, Celeste, is that we create. Milani creates. Kendra creates. Celeste, you create. And even Amanda and AJ, right? And everyone in the webinar, thank you for being here. Thank you for your courage to show up every day and to create no matter what. And um, cheers to creating, y'all. Yes, I, I just want to wait. thank Celeste. <laughs> <laughs> cheers. Yeah, I want to thank Celeste so much for um, thinking of me and my family. We appreciate you so much. And I can't wait to work together again. Michelle, I can't wait to see if we could work together soon and make sure we have something coming up for our 60th anniversary. And I just want to thank everyone for this opportunity. It's been really great. Thank all of you. Yeah. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you. Yeah. Just thank, thank you, oh, you all. God. Amanda. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, thank you, yes, thank you, Thank you, Milani. Curator, <laughs> Milani. Yes, and AJ. Thank you. Yeah, AJ. <laughs> Let's right. keep creating together guys keep creating right, and we will see you next month for bruising views bye great bye